office at the time, Dave, was very helpful as well as organizing this stuff, this trip of mine. So my name is Andrew Verna. I'm the CTO for hardware at Xanadu. Uh, Xanadu is a company building uh, quantum computers uh, using photonics. I can tell you a little bit about our company and our technology. It'll be a little bit more technical, I would say, than, than perhaps the theme of some of what we've heard so far today, um, and uh, tell you a little bit about how uh, photonics intersects with the semiconductor industry and where uh, big uh, customers in the semiconductor industry and, and we think will be uh, even more significant customers in the future as we ramp the quality. I'm not sure how to cue a slide here. Our mission is to build uh, quantum computers that are useful and available to people everywhere. Uh, broadly speaking, that build quantum computers that are useful is connected to error correction and fault tolerance. These are two essential ingredients that are uh, the most impactful in making sure that the applications our computers can address uh, will be actually able to address, uh, uh, you know, uh, deliver customer value. Um, we're based in Toronto, Canada, uh, about seven, a little over seven years old now. We were founded in 2016. Uh, over uh, just about 200 people, and we've uh, primarily venture back, uh, raised about 275 million in the US uh, so far. We have a number of partners and customers. So we're a full stack company. We work both on the hardware as well as the software. Um, our software suite is called Penny Lane. I'm going to be mostly talking about the hardware, but I just want to put this quick slide up here to let you know uh, a little bit about some of the partners and customers that we already have. And what you'll notice in, in connection with the theme of the event today is that a number of the application spaces here are very much connected to the sustainability theme. Um, so you'll notice, for example, uh, quantum simulations of battery materials. I work with uh, Volkswagen on helping develop algorithms that will one day run on quantum computers and help design uh, better materials, better chemistry algorithms that can be used to select uh, the next generation of uh, candidate materials for next generation batteries. And we have a number of other partnerships uh, with other auto, uh, others in the auto sector on similar themes. On the software side, a number of different partnerships, especially with um, Amazon Web Services, with whom we work on our quantum software, uh, and NVIDIA on the hybrid computing platform for the Quite a lot of interest across uh, most of the large multinationals in, in quantum cases. Most of them do have a, 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 <coughs> pardon me, a quantum team now, and are proud to work with quite a few. So if you Google quantum computing, uh, what you'll find is a, a pretty common theme of what that you know, looks like in the minds of, uh, of the public. So just about all the results you see are either from Google or IBM, so the two sort of dominant players in this space. There's a lot of other startups, uh, in, in, you know, we're a good company, but Predominantly, you'll see the results. There's Sundar Pichai, uh, great uh, at, at Google, presenting theirs. And one other common theme in the hardware is you'll see these things exist in a chandelier inside a, a cryostat, essentially a, 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 an extreme cold uh, refrigerator. And that's quite a, a difference between the technology that uh, sort of those dominant players would, would typically present and the, and the way our technology works. And that's because it's based on photonics. So on the right there, you compare all of that circuitry, everything there in, in you know, a cryostat sitting at a temperature colder than interstellar space, and compare it with our photonic device, which works at room temperature. So it does not require any cooling in order to deliver the quantum advantage uh, that, that, that everyone's going after today. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how this works and, and what we've done so far. A lot of advantages, um, as I mentioned, right? We, we set ourselves apart from others in the space by operating at room temperature. Because we use photonics, it intrinsically is not sensitive to the same kind of thermal noise issues that the other approaches have. So we can, we can do just about everything at room temperature, and all of our factual computation happens at room temperature. It's manufactured using silicon processes. The materials we use are at home in CMOS fabs, silicon, silicon nitride, and the like. Um, so that allows us access to and uh, leverage a lot of the uh, mature semiconductor industry. As I mentioned, we are semiconductor customers, and it's one of the other reasons it's very exciting to be here in Taiwan, and especially Shinshu, which is sort of the mecca for a lot of these processes. That allows us to scale much faster when it does time to come time to ramp up. The flexibility in implementing error correction that's at the architectural layer, extremely important. The implementation of error correction and fault tolerance is what separates the present day technology and quantum computing that is available from where we need to be in order to deliver real customer value. And that's the applications that require error correction and fault tolerance and that typically work with a million qubits or more. So that's where we need to get that error correction flexibility is afforded by the photonic access to lots of different software layer protocols that are simply unavailable in others. And that's in turn connected to the modular ability, mo modularity and networkability of our approach, which is, uh, what we, which is owed to uh, the availability of optical fiber. So because our uh, information is already encoded in light, in photons, the chips that we build can be interconnected and the qubits can be distributed in quantum information exchange over fiber optics, the same fiber optic that facilitates uh, you know, the, the 
modern optical telecom and data income industry. So we get to borrow a lot from there. We can use faster clock speeds because we're using optics. Bandwidths are intrinsically much higher than other approaches, allowing our gate speeds to be in principle much higher as well. And as I mentioned, uh, a very common theme is that we're compatible with telecom and data comp. We do everything at 50-50, the same wavelength as long haul uh, telecom. And that's very advantageous because we don't have to reinvent a lot of wheels. We can borrow lasers, fiber optics, fiber components, WDM, everything that came out of the, 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 the telecom community traditionally and has been scaling much faster in the data comm industry as well. And that allows us to eventually develop our uh, uh, sort of cheaper, uh, uh, you know, lower cost per qubit in our development approach. So this uh, we're very proud of. It was the world's first commercially cloud deployed photonic quantum computer and allowed us to join the ranks of IBM, Google, and the others uh, who are putting quantum computers available for uh, people to use over the cloud. So our X8 device, uh, that's a silicon nitride integrated photonic chip. Um, it's been online, it's still online, running over our, uh, our cloud platform since 2019, essentially without maintenance or interruption. Again, showing the power of uh, photonics and uh, integrated photonics in delivering a stable platform for users. Uh, we actually published some results uh, a number of years ago, uh, just a few years ago actually, in uh, Nature, uh, how we ran quantum circuits with many photons on that pra uh, programmable nanophotonic chip. And much of what we're doing is now essentially taking that X8 style device and optimizing it. Working with fabs, um, working with our own process engineers to develop the fabrication processes needed to get very, very high quality waveguides, very high quality optical components, um, chip packaging uh, process, uh, uh, process development and the like in order to deliver uh, error correction and fault tolerance into the same devices that X8 is based on. And we did scale up the chip as well. We, uh, there's a picture of X40. We didn't cloud deploy that one, but we did uh, manage to get quite a few uh, qubits and quite a few gates into one chip. Again, uh, these are uh, silicon nitride based for which I have uh, photonic integrated circuits. A little more recently, um, we also deployed over the cloud um, the, uh, a device that we call Borealis. Um, that was a, a machine that's capable of delivering quantum computational advantage. That means actually being able to beat a supercomputer, the most, actually the largest and fastest supercomputer uh, in the world is what we benchmarked against. That's Fugaku of Japan. That's what it looks like. It's a, it's a machine enclosed by a nice glowing box. So most of that is for marketing purposes. That looks and what's under the hood is essentially a demonstration of our fiber networking architecture. So we heavily use optical fiber, in this case using it to store, process, and implement gates on humans. And that, Beside the chips is the key, one of the key components and one of the key technologies that we had to prove. And this allowed us to benchmark that technology in a very, very demanding context. That being a sort of mathematically provable demonstration of quantum advantage at a very specific, well-defined computational task, beating the fastest supercomputers in the world. As I mentioned, um, you know, X8 was the first commercially cloud-deployed photonic quantum computer. Well, Borealis was the first cloud deployed machine capable of quantum advantage at all, and actually remains so. So Google famously also demonstrated quantum advantage, but did not make that available over the cloud. There was another academic demonstration from a USDC in China, again, not available for cloud access and not programmable. So this is the first and only commercially available uh, cloud accessible machine that can actually beat a, a, a cloud, uh, the, the fastest supercomputer in the world, ordinary supercomputer in the world that uses a classical we were the first uh, quantum advantage demo from a startup company. So again, uh, we're competing with some big players, Google and IBM, and this allowed us to, uh, to really plant our flag. And it was the first photonic machine uh, capable of uh, quantum advantage that had all the gates programmable. So you need to be able to feed information into a machine in order for it to be a computer. And we hope that we'd all agree and, and this did uh, have that advantage. And again, really the story behind the story, this generated a lot of splash for us. We also were able to get it published in Nature. Um, we had it uh, on the Amazon uh, Web Services uh, uh, quantum cloud platform as well for uh, about a year. But really the story behind the story is what this said about our push toward that final frontier that stands between us, where we are today, and, uh, and commercially yet useful applications, and that's the implementation of uh, fault tolerance and error correction in our, in, our, uh, in our architecture. And a very key part of that, as I mentioned, was the fiber interconnects that are needed um, in our architecture with that. So this allowed us to sort of showcase that technology um, in a both cloud deployed, so commercially available, stable way, um, uh, but also uh, the very high performance requirements that we uh, have to operate under and the constraints around optical losses and phase stability in those fibers because it's, it's a coherent uh, communication protocol we use. Um, allow us to show that again in a very demanding context. So for the rest of, of um, the, just the last five minutes of my talk, 
I would like to talk a little bit more about our architecture for implementing that holy grail. So how do we achieve error correction? How do we achieve fault tolerance? And again, these are the features that, that everyone needs to, uh, needs to implement, whether it's a Google super connecting approach, I have to use trap line approach, or other photonic approaches. There is no useful quantum computing, commercially useful return on investment, if you cannot implement error correction and fault tolerance. In the same way that there's no long haul communication, if you don't have some sort of so I won't get into all the technical details of how this works for us, um, maybe just the broad strokes of, of what the technology looks like. So our technology is based on silicon nitride fixed photonic integrated circuits, as I mentioned. We use these to generate our qubits, very similar devices to the X8 chip that I showed you before, and it's very modular. So you don't need to have that many of them on a single device. You can have a little tray on a, on a, on a single PCB, uh, as, as we showed, uh, a 12 channel system here in a red. Some of the photons go into what we call our multiplexer. Multiplexer chip is essentially um, a fancy name for an optical router, an optical switch. Um, the best multiplexers that we currently use are based on lithium niobate, a very common material you see in the optics industry, and again, something that can be processed in, in modern fabs. The MUX essentially switches based on the information available from our detectors uh, coming out of our fix. It switches our qubits in and out and make, directs them to the right fiber channels. And those fiber channels, and being able to select which fiber channels we're in, sounds sort of like a simple task in photonics. It is, however, doing so in the, in the context of switching qubits, places some tighter constraints on the performance, namely optical loss. And that's a common theme throughout all of the different devices, whether it's in fiber, uh, whether it's the uh, silicon nitride fix, or whether it's the lithium niobate multiplexer chips. The common feature and the common performance um, curve that we have to be ahead of is, is optical loss loss of the wave bed. The photon is lost, that's a source of one of those errors that we need to correct. So you need the best possible baseline of having a low error rate uh, in order to uh, achieve um, you know, a, a default line threshold and actually get useful, uh, useful applications. This drawing here, this cube of points, this is just a render of the sort of um, lattice work of qubits that we have to put together in order to implement some of these protocols for fault tolerance. You see these edges, that represents quantum entanglement between the nodes, and the nodes here are qubits. And our qubits are pulses of light. Those pulses of light are generated in that top layer there in the sources by X8 side devices. Some of the photons are detected and some of the photons flow out to the next layer, which is our multiplexer device. So these are renders. Can't show you any photos yet of what these look like, but we do have for all of these uh, physical prototypes that are performing in the lab today. And we're constantly working, as I mentioned, with fabs on both what the ramp to volume is going to look like and making sure that that ramp to volume is, is properly informed by design for manufacture right now. And that leads us to work directly with process engineers and in fact deploy our own process engineers who work on the manufacturing process to get us very, very low loss optical waveguides, get us very low loss packaging. So I can talk a bit more about sort of what challenges and uh, progress we've made and also what challenges remain again between us today and where we need to be specifically around the hardware development. This is quite technical, so maybe I'll just focus on what we think is mostly solved and when we say solved in our kind of R&D phase is what we're not too worried about or rather has been reduced to more of a manufacturing problem. Can we do this for low enough cost? So lasers, mostly solved. Um, certain detectors, we have a good partnership with the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST in the US, that's allowed us to solve this. Cryogenics, we do need some of those for our detectors. The computation doesn't have to be cold. Some of our detectors do need to be kept cold. So we've pretty much solved that. That's, that's meant by present day technology essentially didn't need any Optical networking, so how do we communicate these qubits between our chips? Again, fiber is the answer. Our fiber interconnects need to be a little more stringent in their constraints than the typical fiber interconnects that are hosted in a data center. But they do need to be a lot cheaper, and this is where we're working with some OSATs. How do we build uh, low loss uh, phase table, polarization table, and packlet uh, balance modules? Again, we have these in the lab, about 100 of them, and they're going into our first um, system that's capable of demonstrating all the building blocks for universal fault tolerance, uh, but we do need to make these cheaper. Currently, these are a few thousand dollars a piece. We need that about 10 times cheaper to be able to scale that to the millions that we'll need for our whole full scale data center. And, and then on the gates and error correction, a lot of the passives are just about fine, and we do work a lot in the MPGA space on algorithm development. A little too soon to tell how demanding that classical digital version is going to be, but we think it's not, it's not too much of a problem so far. Now this is where the challenges lie. So this is where we're focused in our process development with our fab partners. Low loss silicon nitride, we're constantly trying to drive the raw propagation loss. That's our key metric in our big platforms now. We need ultimately below a dB per meter, so 0.01 dB per centimeter, and that's a silicon nitride. 
a couple of other materials as well we need to work on, like lithium ion beta driving into loss down as well. Very related metrics to the to the uh, sort of uh, the way that we make our qubits, so called squeeze states. Again, you still need to drive that loss. Low loss chip fiber interfaces are also very important. So we need to again come the chip to the fiber with ex without losing many photons. We've demonstrated around 0.1 dB in that interconnect. That's better than anyone has reported, just about anywhere. Um, but again, we need to get that into a large scale manufacturing process. And then the major uh, platform integration uh, work that we have to do is about getting those uh, lithium niobate the low loss integrated switches co integrated with high performance photodiodes. And these are conventional photodiodes that uh, you'd be familiar with in, in transceivers. Final talk that I'd like to leave you with is you know, lest you otherwise think that quantum computing is sort of a small scale technology, something that belongs in a science lab. If you believe that quantum computing is going to be successful, whether it's in photonics or any other approach, but I'll say especially photonics, it's equivalent, that belief is equivalent to believing that there will need to be enormous numbers of modules in these quantum computers. So tens of thousands of racks just to deliver the first quantum computer that will actually tackle a useful customer problem. Quantum computing is a data center proposition. One of the things we like to do is kind of study, well, what does that imply about the wafer volume? the actual chip real estate that we'll need to equip one of these quantum data centers when we do build it at this scale with the photonic integrated circuits that will deliver, again, fault tolerance and error correction at the scale of one million qubits. Well, you can go through the, the, the math, how many qubits translates to how many physical IP blocks for qubit synthesis, and how big is one of those qubit IP blocks on the wafer, and how many, uh, in this case, say, 200 millimeter wafers is that going to take up? You can do the same calculus for 300 of those. The answer is a lot by photonic standards, maybe not by semiconductor CMOS standards, but we project um, to add about 100 logical qubits of capacity per year to our data center in the next, say, five to seven years, will require about 100,000 200 millimeter or 50,000 300 millimeter wafers every year. And that's comparable to the present day telecom and data com silicon photonic markets in wafer supply. So we're going to be customers of this, and one, we'd like to transmit this slide to say, well, this is an opportunity. This is a, for CMOS, low volume for photonics, very high volume, likely high margin of proposition. The reason being, we do imagine that the yield is going to be fairly low because of our demanding constraints, and we accept that the quantum computing industry is going to have to eat that yield. So these are wafer starts. We're not asking for necessarily the most demanding process control, um, and we're going to have to reject a lot of wafers, and we accept that. So the success implies continual capacity scaling and design improvements leading to wafer volumes that do rival the present day silicon photonics uh, entire manufacturing capacity. So we're going to be there in a few years. I'll leave you with a nice photo of downtown Toronto looking west from our lab. A very nice place to work as well, thank you. Thanks very much.